Um, so Matt just touched on the importance of documentation for historical preservation. So um, I'm going to introduce our first speakers, uh, Vince Scolisi. Um, um, Vince serves as the chief technologist for Tech Render. He earned his Bachelor's of Science in, in, in Engineering from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. With a background of senior level engineering project management, Vince has extensive experience with the AEC, AEC industry, working with commercial, industrial, municipal, and internationally recognized clients. Vince is a leader in integrating emerging technologies in laser scanning, drone photo photogrammetry, and digital modeling, positioning tech render to revolutionize the building and architectural documentation industry. Uh, our second speaker is William Kruger. Uh, William is an educator at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, in the School of Architecture and Urban Planning. Um, with a passion for historical preservation technologies. The purpose is to highlight and further and sustain research that examines the legacy and limitations associated with preserving and conserving of the world's culture and heritage. Please join me in welcoming Vince and William. Thank you. Hey everybody. So this is our presentation on 3D laser scan documentation uh, of existing environments. So throughout the presentation, we'll refer to 3D laser scanning as LIDAR technology. Light detection and ranging is what that stands for. So brief overview of what we're going to cover today. We're going to acquire knowledge of what 3D laser scanning is, discovering how it works, the advantages. We'll go through a lot of project examples so everybody can get an idea of how the technology can be applied in the real world. And then we'll discuss the evolution and integration of photogrammetry to laser scan data. So this is a graphic of the laser scanning device. If you walk through the exhibits that we have set up, both uh, the UWM table and the tech render table adjacent to it, you'll see the actual scanning device. So what you see here is about the size of a shoebox, and it sits on a, on a tripod, and it rotates 360 degrees in the horizontal plane, and it uses a mirror that also rotates while the device is rotating to get 300 degrees in the vertical. So you collect data on everything within line of sight of the device, except for what's beneath it, which is usually just the tripod. So the scanner itself collects data points at a million points per second. So it's acquiring uh, just a vast amount of data at a very quick speed. And the way it works is laser beams emitted from the device, reflects off of an object, records an XYZ coordinate, and then comes back to, to the device to generate a 3D point cloud of the environment that you're scanning. And so you can see in this graphic here, with one laser scan set up, you capture everything within line of sight. So when we apply that to, let's say, scanning a vehicle, four scan setups, so long as that there's enough overlap between the scan setups, you can stitch those together to get a, a complete model. So, so in this application here, we had four different scans to get you to the singular model of the car. And so laser scan technology is very much a function of line of sight data capture. So sort of keep that in mind as, as we step through examples here. And so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to William to start going through a couple examples here. Thanks, Vince. So the stuff I'm going to show you are pieces of work that I've done over the last 14 years. I started scanning 14 years ago, and the original scanner is also in there, so it's kind of a museum piece at this point. Um, so when you, when you come by the booth, check it out. So laser scanning is just a really good way to document something without having to touch it. Using traditional methods, you have to get out a tape measure, or perhaps if it's a very ornate thing, you'd have to make a a cast of it, and that's all very invasive. You have to contact the thing. If you make a casting, there's always a chance that it's going to come apart. So with laser scanning, it's a nice hands-off approach of gathering data. It's safer and quicker and more efficient. And then once you have the data, say the date piece is damaged or something, you can go into it and digitally repair it. You know, fix the thing so now you can go to the next step. There's just a lot of inherent value in doing this. Um, oops, hit the wrong thing. There we go. So this example here, uh, I think this is 2007. 
the Northwestern Mutual Life Building. So initially what they wanted to do was repair just the corners of the building. And they asked, can you document this? All we really want is the laser pointer work. Yeah, it doesn't shine on there. Initially all they wanted was the center line to center line distance on the brackets holding up the cornice. They said, that's all we need. I'm like, okay. So from the sidewalk, scan the perimeter of the building and started giving them the data. And the way I drew it up, they were like, well, this is really cool. Can you give us elevation <laughs> studies too? And I'm like, yeah, I, I can do that. So without having to go back out, I used the same data and you know did some elevation drawings and some section cuts, etc., of the visible data. And they found this very useful. Um, I did charge them more. <laughs> uh, here, St. Paul Crossing, one floor in the building was fairly vacant, and they wanted to verify the footprint and the overall the location of the supporting columns, etc. Um, so scanned it in one day, and we found out that the floor plate was actually about 200 square feet larger than they, the design drawings from the 1920s. And my best determination is that in the bottom right-hand corner, when they set up the foundation, they set up on the wrong side of the line. But over 70 years, 200 square feet on about nine floors, well, if you're an accountant, you tell me how much revenue you lost. So these kind of things are important. And also, where exactly are the supporting columns? Yes, they should be on a grid. Because I remember when I drew it up, everything was perfect. Well, when the contractor comes out and puts it in, there's an inch this way, an inch that way. You know, things change. Things don't go up the way they're designed. They never do. And that's okay. This example here, um, the Paps Mansion, many of you may be familiar with it. And also when you come by the booth, there's a hologram. Uh, so you'll see a piece of plastic laying on the floor. Walk over close to it and this whole building will pop up before you. Um, so it's falling apart. We scanned it drew every piece of terracotta on the building. And then as I was doing my research, I discovered that there had been some Habs drawings prepared, but never submitted. So these Habs drawings, I started looking at them, it's like, well, the dome looks like it does in the picture, but that's not reality. The dome is actually taller. So here's, you know, whomever prepared these drawings was doing the best job they could. I'm not faulting them but they also did not take into consideration that you need to get up on the building. You need to use good surveying practices and techniques to get the actual curvature of the dome because in order for it to look like that in perspective, it has to be taller like it is in reality in the bottom right hand corner. Here's another example, the Wisconsin Historical Society reading room. They were going to renovate it. Um, there was a false ceiling put in at one point, and you can see it in the lower left-hand corner of the picture. Um, it was all covered up, and they had no existing drawings of the walls, the floor plans, nothing. And they said, we really need a map so that we can you know, do our programming for the restoration process. And they had a couple panels open on the ceiling, and I'm like, so what's up there? And they said, well, it's a very ornate you know, plaster ceiling. And I'm like, well, I can get that if you take more panels out while I'm scanning the rest of the room. So they got some guys in, they pulled out a bunch of panels, and I was able to capture that. So in the top left-hand corner, I know it kind of looks like a tablecloth, but that is uh, the ornate plaster ceiling that's up there. Now, granted, it's not a close-up scan for reverse engineering, but it is a good map for them to understand what the rest of the ceiling looks like, because this is a typical condition. Uh, above the false ceiling and they wanted that restored so from our scan data we did you know floor plans elevations sections uh, all kinds of stuff so here you can see you know in the bottom in the top corner are the scan data that's the inside shell of that room and that's all we were really asked to do and you can see the old scanner up there in the top right hand corner again you got to look at this thing yes photos that are in blue, then the output can be the drawing? Yes. Yeah, what you're seeing in blue is the three-dimensional point cloud, and from that we can maneuver it in any direction. We can look at it from the top, the side. We basically isolate sections of the cloud so that we're just looking at that portion. And from that, then we can make 
two-dimensional drawings or three-dimensional models. And this is just a close-up of one of the capitals with a scale thrown on it. There's a section through the library. And then there's um, the not-so-interesting stuff for historic preservationists. This is BIM modeling. BIM stands for Building Information Modeling. Um, it's a very valuable service, and many people, well, actually, everybody needs it, but they don't know it. Um, this is Johnson Controls. There was one of their office buildings. They were remodeling it, and they were like, we don't know where all the pipes are. We can see them, but we don't really know exactly where they're at. So we went in and scanned it when it was gutted, and then we drew a whole 3D model, a BIM model, of the remaining existing uh, HVAC, the steam lines, the power runs, all the supporting columns, downspouts, everything that came into that space. We gave the architect a 3D model, then they could move forward with their design process without the risk of change orders. Change orders are huge, you always have them. The idea with laser scanning is to reduce the number of change orders because you have an accurate model to begin with. It's very important. It, this is a close up of that same model, just showing the different elements within the building. Then there's fun stuff like the horse barn in Madison. Um, we did this for the university. Uh, one of the instructors was using it as a project for his students. And then we, it was 72 scans inside and out. Um, so we did a slice through the building. So you can see, you know, all the bumps and warts and quirks of the building. Over time, things settle, they shift, they move. And you also find out really odd things about building structure. The whole haymow was dark. I couldn't see anything. So we're up there scanning. And I didn't know what the upper supports were doing. When I got the model and started putting the scans together and, and analyzing it, I thought I had done something wrong because this doesn't meet that. I thought, what the heck's going on? And then I looked more closely at the scans. There's some huge metal brackets marching all the way down the building. It is designed where those pieces don't touch each other, but they're held together with a metal bracket. It's not your traditional, you know, beams resting on columns kind of thing. It was really interesting, but the scan data showed me that. I couldn't see it when I was in the barn. The scanner works in the dark. And then we made a 3D model with all the structure and everything for the students, and then they actually built a model from this, a physical model, uh, to scale. And let's see, does this work? Uh, Now, this is an older scanner. It's very crude color overlays. The color overlays now with the scanner is so much better. It just it, it makes me want to cry because it was hard to use the color overlays in the past. But that's, you, get, you have to try these things and tell them what they did wrong. You got to tell the manufacturer, it's like, this isn't working. You need to fix this. And I was on them for a long time on that when we got out the new scanner. I don't know, I'm sure it wasn't solely me. It had to be other people too complaining about the overlays, but it's it's amazing now. Yes? So this is kind of a fly around, but do you do walkthroughs in these buildings as You can well? do that as well. Okay, I'm just curious. Do you do them often with the projects you do, or not quite so much with what you um, do? Occasionally. It's usually not needed other than for, you know, show the, the glitzy part. People want to, oh, I want to see the fly around. And I do too. But as far as the... The, the contractors and the engineers, etc. They're like, yeah, it's all cute. Give me the data. But in, in terms of this workshop with the theaters, can we actually make walkthroughs for the theaters? And Definitely. And have that kind of be publications and kind of marketing? Yes. And that could all be set up on a website and accessible. It, that's one of the beauties of the laser scan data. There's so much you can do with it. You can make 2D drawings, 3D models. You can also do virtual um, tours. Uh, there's things called web share, and then there's also the virtual fly arounds. You can also put on VR goggles and, and enter it. There's, it's a, it, the, when you do the scanning, there's so much that can be made from it. That snapshot in time. Then there's other kind of scanners, and we have them all here. This is the scan arm. 
Uh, this is really good for reverse engineering decorative elements. Uh, typically, the scan arm is found in factories, like they're making engine blocks or something like that. They use it for geometric tolerancing. The inspector will be checking every piece and making sure it's made correctly and then shipping it down the line. But they also have a laser scanning head attachment for these. Um, so when I started looking at doing this 14 years ago, the laser scanning manufacturers are like, you're going to do what with it? I'm going to document buildings. And they're like, oh, well, I said, well, what do you use it for? Well, we go into gravel pits and scan piles of dirt so we know how much dirt we have. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, so that piece that he was scanning there, uh, this is a Louis Sullivan mold. The Carson Perry Scott building in Chicago, Illinois, built around 1908, I'm guessing. Um, it has a lot of decorative metal elements on the base of it. The first two stories is just a beautiful building. Uh, we're lucky to have some of the molds of those pieces. We have about a dozen at the university. So our intention is, you know, we keep scanning them and hopefully one day we could like reverse engineer and make molds and maybe put an archway in the courtyard. But that all takes time and money and you've got to have both. And that's just more of the uh, product that we put out. Now, we also do 3D printing at the university. We have different kinds of 3D printers. So in the bottom left-hand corner, the mold, when you originally look at it, is about five feet by eight feet. Um, when you have these things scanned, you can scale them up or down. So we scaled it down to fit in our printer. And you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, there's a pen and a pad of paper, and then that mold scaled down to about uh, 11 by 17. So when you have some decorative element, you know, say you want to have a fundraiser, and oh, I've got this, this lion statue. Uh, okay, we'll give every fundraiser that gives us X amount of dollars a little lion statue so they can put it on their desk. Yes? Can you 3D print color? Yes. We do not currently have the color 3D printers anymore, but they are out there. We had them initially. Um, they're getting better. They wear out very fast. And they're a lot of expense to maintain. So I would find a contractor that has a 3D printer and make them print it. <laughs> so speaking of lion statues, the lion, uh, lions at the Lake Park Bridge, they were going to do work on the bridge to restore it. And they had no copy of the lion in case it got damaged. There's, let me see, there's eight lions, two at the entrance of each approach of the two different spans. We had, I talked to the municipality and I said, you know, we can scan this, so we'd only need to do one because it's a mirror image of the other, so and we can scale it down or up and we'll have a record of it. And they said, well, great. And he said, well, we had a copy, like from the 80s, and we don't know where it is. They had actually made a copy, put it in a crate, and stuck it in a warehouse somewhere in Milwaukee. But they don't know where it's at. And this, I think this happens a lot. And the same thing is true of your digital data. If you get a copy of your stuff, you got to know where it's at, have a couple of copies, and touch it every now and then to make sure it's still a valid copy. Because that can disappear just as well. And that is just an important part of heritage and conservation is maintaining your digital files. And then, can you hit play again, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes? How large are the digital files? Um, when we do a scan with the 350S, the one that sits on top of the tripod, that can be anywhere from a quarter gig or even smaller, all the way up to a gig per scan, depending on the resolution. Um, and again, that's really the big thing is uh, the resolution of the scan. And then, too, like with this, I don't recall off the top of my head, because this is probably six, seven years ago. But you gather the data, then I decimate it down and get it cleaned up. And then that has been a reduction in data right there, because there'd be a lot of repetitive, you'll scan the same area two, three times, trying to get all the nooks and crannies. And then when you process it, you get rid of the extra data. The layers that are on top and it's going to distill down to a model.
And then once you have the model, it's not actually scan data anymore. It's, it's, a, it's a different animal. Yeah. <laughs> done this type of stuff before with photobarometry mm -hmm. and photobarometry doesn't work when you have shiny surfaces. I'm assuming that you have the same type of parameters here. Now, so the kryptonite of laser scanning is flat black, mirrors, um, glass to a certain point, and shiny surfaces. Um, scanned a building in St. Louis that the marble base was so polished, I, I didn't think anything of it. And then when I opened the data, when you have point cloud data, it's a very <laughs> thin layer of points that from the reflecting back of the, the, the surface. Well, with that very polished marble base, the layer of data was probably about an eighth of an inch, which to me is a lot. Well, you average that down, there's tools in the software that basically decimate it down to an average. And honestly, that is better than going out with a tape measure. Um, so yes, there are inherent problems. The best thing you can do for shiny surfaces is to get them dirty. There is practices for this. So um, I was scanning in a hospital and all the black pipe had to be documented because they were gutting it. So I went in after they gutted it and the black pipe wasn't picking up in the scans at all. So I ran around with really cheap white spray paint, I asked the contractor and everybody to make sure this is cool and just nailed everything. Just the light coating didn't have to be solid, but just enough to make it dusty. And then it picked up fine. Now with things that like art pieces, you're not gonna spray paint them. <laughs> but uh, what you do is you talcum powder mixed with alcohol, there's a little bit of a mist and that wipes right off. And I think there's actually products out there now that they sell specifically for that. So, and then, uh, yeah, so with glass too, anytime it goes through, there's a possibility of it refracting and throwing it off um, that you just have to take that into consideration and have windows open doors open scan inside and out because um, well, I, I got to talk to you later about something I found in the third ward <laughs> so, anyway. um, so then here's you know a model printed out so that line statue which is the size of that table is now in your hand so there's just there's tons of examples. I've done probably a hundred jobs over the years, and there's this, just come talk to me. I've done everything from caves to statues. Um, you, you can see it, you can scan it. Go ahead. Yeah. I think it's really effective to talk about what the speed was 14 years ago versus what you're speed is now. Because I think that was a You mean on the scanners yeah. itself? Yeah. Yeah, well, the old scanner, the one that, my, my museum piece in there, um, I thought it was on top of the world when it had a 75 meter range and it took 120,000 points per second data. I was, I was just blown away. Because we had looked at other scanners, Matt Geralds and I, um, when I was still a student, we started seeing this technology come. And the first scanner I saw, it looked like an ancient TV from the 50s and it shot a 60 degree cone. And I was just blown away. I was like, this is amazing. Because I was getting every individual brick on the top of one of the university buildings from about, you know, 300 feet away. And I'm like, this is amazing. And he said, okay, so what do you do now? He says, well, I just turn it a little bit and, you know, I shoot again. But you're getting this weird cone of data. Then the next year they came out with these other scanners, the one that my museum piece, where it did the complete dome of data like Vince had described in the beginning of the program. Um, the speed is much faster, you know, now it's a million points instead of 120,000. The range is 300 meters rather than 75. Um, and also the equipment is so much lighter. The unit I had, the head was 45 pounds, the tripod was 20 pounds, you had to have a 50 pound suitcase battery, there was a huge cable, and you had to have a computer hooked to it. Now, what is it, an 11 pound head and a graphite tripod? That's it. And the camera's built in. If I wanted to use the camera feature, there was another piece you had to put on top that, and you slid the camera over and you lowered it to the same position. And it was all, that was my issue with the whole thing. It's like, how do I lower it 20 centimeters exactly? You, you mark it on there, but it's a hand crank and a physical mark. It, you know, I, we really took uh, the manufacturer to task on that. It was like, okay, 
you tell them, you know, salesmen, they, they'll tell you everything will work, and then you actually try to get it to work. So, yeah. Yep. So now we're going to jump into some of the limitations which we briefly touched on. So, um, just to start and continue that conversation about the highly reflective surfaces, so things like curtain walls, glass, anything with that glossy finish. And what this really does is it increases the importance of the lighting conditions that you're capturing the data under. So a really sunny day is going to create a lot of refractions off of these glossy surfaces, a lot of reflections, and it can sometimes trick the scanning device into thinking something's there when it's really not. Um, and the photogrammetry technology, the post-processing that's going into photogrammetry is getting better in dealing with those glossy finishes. But in addition to that, the, the lighting conditions that you're capturing this data under become even more important when you're working with those glossy finishes. And like we talked about at the beginning of the program, uh, laser scanning is very much a function of line of sight data capture. So it can make it difficult to capture information on rooftops or architectural pieces that are you know, positioned high up on a building, on a tower, and so forth. And so that's what's bringing us into the conversation around photogrammetry. So similar to the 3D point cloud that you can get from a laser scan, scanning device, you can generate using a collection of you know, hundreds of photos from different positions on an object. That, that can, those can create a 3D point cloud that you can then now start to integrate with the laser scan data. So when we talk of the limitations and the gaps that sometimes you see with the traditional laser scanning approach, you can really start to minimize those by, you know, having a camera mounted to a drone and flying that drone in the air. You know, sometimes if you're in an urban environment with your with your laser scanner, you can go on an adjacent building to get a certain vantage point on information that you have to gather. But, you know, case in point, you know, in the setting that we're in today, not an urban environment, no adjacent buildings to get some of these roof lines that we see. But with a very fast drone flight, you can collect hundreds of photos, generate that 3D point cloud, and then tie both the point cloud and laser from photogrammetry and laser scanning together. And so, I'm going to touch on three project examples, one that was uh, laser scanning only, one that's photogrammetry only, and then the third that integrates both technologies. So the first example, which maybe some of us are familiar with, is Trinity Lutheran Church. Uh, the church was constructed in 1878 in Milwaukee, and in the summer of 2018, there, was a, there were renovations going on in the roof that sparked a fire, and the, entire, the entirety of the roof structure burn and collapse on itself before you know it was able to be extinguished. Very similar to what happened in France with the Cathedral of Notre Dame. However, unlike the Cathedral of Notre Dame, there were no scans done inside this church. So you, you're left with whatever you know historic plans are around, if you can find them, and whatever photos that happen to have been taken in the space that you can use for historical context. And so this is a photo of the site after the fire. And so you can see there's a little bit of evidence as to what that roof structure was, but for the most part, you're not left with a ton of context here. And so this next uh, slide is a video that if we can press play on that one, it's a fly through of the point cloud. And so in two days of field work and another two days of post-processing, we're able to generate this digital model, one-to-one -one scaled version of the conditions after the fire. And so within less than a week, we're able to turn this digital model over to the architects where they can bring it into their design programs and immediately start to reconstruct their existing conditions post-fire for the reconstruction and rehabilitation of the space. And so as you can see, I mean, imagining going through here with tape measures and traditional documentation purposes, it's, it's quite the environment to have to work in. And so being able to go from no model to a computerized version in less than a week really highlights the pace at which you can move and how efficient you can be with laser scanning without you know, putting people at risk trying to move through debris. And so I, I believe in total it was 30 color scans, interior and exterior, to generate this model. And so we're sort of ending here at this column cap of which there were 13. And so this video here is um, the second application where we're using a handheld scanner to document at uh, high density the device without you know, having to do those invasive techniques like William was describing before, taking a cast of the model and actually putting your hands on it and, and manipulating it. We're able to scan it with a handheld scanner 
turn it into a 3D model that can then be loaded into a 3D printer for replication or sent to whatever manufacturer is going to start to work on replacing these. And so of the 13, there were maybe three or four that were in good condition to document the way that we did and move forward with the replication of those. And so here's just a snapshot picture after the new roof structure was put in place. And so the second example, this is a photogrammetry only application. And so this is in Chicopee, Missouri, uh, Massachusetts, the city hall, and the project was on this rose window here. And so as we move to the next slide, you'll see the condition very much changes. So this is a screenshot from the laser scanning device. And between the scaffolding that we were working on and the reinforcements of the window, which was in quite a lot of disrepair. Uh, it was difficult to set up a scanner on a tripod or you know get the certain clearance that you need the two to three feet with the handheld scanner. It was a challenging work environment and so it was much easier to take a handheld digital camera and maneuver around the critical pieces that way and collect hundreds of photos to then recreate these models. So as you can see in this slide here on the left is the infield condition and then on the right is the model that was generated using photogrammetry. And so with photogrammetry, you really start to edge on, this is a video as well, that I'll go from infield to digital model. You really start to edge towards a photorealistic version of what you're scanning. And so in communicating what's going on in the site to you know, our clients who are based in Madison, you're able to turn over a, a 3D mesh that's you know, very, very realistic, as you see in the transition here. We go from infield to 3D computer model using photogrammetry only. And so, Sir, yep. When you do, a, do this, how many times do you pass through to make sure you capture everything at the different angles that you do? Is you do it a number of times? Or? Yeah, so it helps to do it multiple times at different angles. So making three, four passes at slightly different, you know, elevations or angles, and then following it up with taking video in the field as well. So taking a pass of photos, taking a pass of, of videos, so that when you get back in the office, yeah, you make sure. And then also with this specific project, in addition to the photos, I just I did do scans to capture what we had just you know three, four times, just because we know that we can integrate the two. So. It's a little bit of a combination of both. Which brings us to the third example, which is a laser scanning and photogrammetry example. So this is the Memorial Student Union at University of Missouri, Missouri's campus. And so we had access to the interior of the tower. And so we had roof access, which you can see in this photo uh, in the middle here in dark blue. And so we were able to set up our scanner and collect those traditional terrestrial scan laser scans of the interior of that. But as you can see, we didn't have scaffolding for the exterior, and there's a lot of variation on these, on these finials. So what we did was we collected about 13 scans on the interior of the tower, and then over 500 photos and about a dozen videos for, for the exterior, and we were able to mesh those together. So this is a video here that sort of stitches um, the video documentation of what we were doing on site, and then similarly to that last example, it'll transition to uh, the 3D mesh that was our final product that we were able to deliver to our client. And so you can see a pretty nice, easy work environment, great line of sight from the interior for those tripod setups and photo documentation from the inside, but then for the exterior, everything was done with the drone that you can see up there. So this is that fully recreated 3D model, interior and exterior, using both photogrammetry and laser scanning. And these files, you know, we were able to slice these, cut them down, narrow them down to what was uh, the pieces that were needed for CNCing of the stone for replacement. And so here's a snapshot where you can see the high level of detail, those grout lines, and, and really get a good picture of what's going on in the field to communicate that to the clients. And that sort of wraps up our, uh, our presentation and, so, and um, the technology and where we're moving with everything. And so now if anybody has any questions, we'd uh, love to answer. Yep. So in the example with the fire, the church, with the four uh, columns, is there an algorithm that can like look at those four remaining columns and basically create a prototype for what a basic column is? 
Yeah, so all of that would have to be definitely reviewed by the structural engineers that are working on the project. But what it allows is that digital model can be brought directly into the design programs. And so as the technology progresses, it sort of begs the question of what you need to recreate. If you need to be recreating those you know, replicas, those computerized versions of that, or if you can just use the data itself, since it is what's in the field, as your starting point, as your existing conditions model to, to do analysis and, and structural design around. So that leads me to my second question. In terms of liability, like in terms of replacing uh, old structures or details to buildings, mm -hmm. how much can you rest on the technology and how much is on your engineer or your architect? Yeah, so the, the programs that we run through generate uh, registration reports, which does an analysis on your point clouds and gives you your mean errors. And so you do have a readout of your precision for what's there, but any sort of additional invasive, um, like invasive, anything that you would have to look at to sort of see what the structure is of those charred beams, you'd really have to get up there and do secondary evaluations of the object, yeah. So it's, it's not a complete replacement of that when you start to talk about um, structural integrity by any means, um, but it is that visual scaled version that you can at least get a start and a basis to work off of. Is there any case law around this? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's always it's a, it's an ongoing thing that's constantly being you know tested and worked with. The Ferro is the platform that we use, um, and they're constantly doing work to get everything written into like certain codes for what you can and can be using it for. So like floor flatness studies and stuff like that. It is definitely a, an evolution that's currently still going on. So yeah, Scandian is just one piece of the puzzle. You're giving them the existing conditions and showing them what's there. Beyond that, you have to let the experts do their work as well. And they're, you know, structural engineers and the people that do the analysis, you know, they can look at the scan data and say, okay, we really need to look at this more closely. And that's where you go back to their traditional methods. They're giving them a slice of information that they just didn't have before. Yep. Yeah, so I was just going to ask, you were talking about the <coughs> Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris. Do you yep. think, are they using the same type of technology mm -hmm. there? Yeah, so luckily enough, there was a professor who was actually a Wisconsin native. He was from Shorewood. Nice. And um, he, I had not, I can't recall what university he was working through, but he, it was a personal project for him to investigate the roof structures and the timber beams that were used. And there were 100-year-old timbers when they were first harvested and then they were left for resting for another hundred years throughout the construction of it. So he took it upon himself to do the laser scanning. And so it just so happened to have existed. The scanning wasn't done for documentation purposes past his passion project. And so they were really lucked out to have had it. But yeah, they did have the entirety of the interior of that structure scanned. So it was, it was pretty lucky that they did, but yeah. As far as the accuracy of the scan, is it 100% is it accurate or 78%? I don't know that there's a specific percentage on it, but we're, we're within the tolerances of millimeters, so it sort of gives you an idea. So as technology evolves and as things happen, I know the iPhone 12 12 has the ability to scan this program to do our scans in our pocket. How soon until this kind of laser beam scanning almost comes into our pocket as well? Because currently it's very expensive, hard for anyone to get a hold of. But how soon do you guys expect for it to kind of be accessible to everyone and almost a tool for everyone to use? Yeah, so there is a LiDAR device on the most recent iPhone. There uh, is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, there is. There is a <laughs> oh, well, right. I've seen I've seen tests of it. It's a, um, not for any engineering purposes. Um, but as you know, like the, the cameras that are going into iPhones, they compete with DSLRs and mirrorless cameras. And so from a photogrammetry uh, aspect, I would say that they're, they're pretty much there for yeah. what you can use. Um, but the LiDAR scanning is, has some, some ways to go. Yeah, it's a little different animal. The LiDAR on the phone is more for 
doing your focusing. You know, so you can get closer or further away and focus on things more readily than you could before. Um, it's not so much for making a 3D model, but the photos that Vince was talking about earlier, that technology, the software for turning photos into 3D images is just really coming along. I first saw it probably 15 years ago, and it's just, this is something else. It's come so far. There's a question over here. Yeah. So you've done an excellent job of showing us how this can be used in the What are the implications of the direction vis-a-vis? Well, well for, for new construction, I think every building should be scanned at every stage as it's going up. So you have that model to compare to your design drawings. That's a part of your building information modeling. Again, when they design a building and they put all these things in, well, there's a there's an intention, but then the reality comes along. So it's like, where did those, you know, where does the, those pipe runs actually end up? Well, your scan data would show you that. So you could go back to that well again and again as the building evolves over time. It's like, okay, we're going to remodel this whole floor 15 years later. What is in here? So we know what we're dealing with, rather than having to uncover it and then find out. Yeah. A question we often get is, you know, what can... Can laser scanning see through a wall, or what can it see beyond that, that interface of just that line of sight? And it, it can't. But if you position the technology like throughout construction, and you're documenting at every every point in time as something is constructed, then building your models on the back end sort of give you that X-ray vision of interiors of walls for renovations and, and critical projects like that. So you think that will be coming? Yes, very much so. Yeah. What, what's the, um, have you used scanning for um, uh, for sort of the glitz side of things, helping to sell a project or sell a, a, a renovation project? Okay. Yeah. I'm thinking like, you know, having little uh, earrings or Christmas tree ornaments for your building as a giveaway for fundraising, etc. Yeah, I mean, creating that, digi that digital twin of, of real world environments, it's, it's priceless. You know, it's, it's something that appeals to everybody to be able to hold a physical object or, you know, with a VR headset in interface with that, that space, um, it really is priceless. So yeah, it definitely goes a long way in terms of communicating an object or a building. Yeah, and being a digital model, you just hit scale in the computer. It's like, well, how big do you want your earring? You know, how big do you want your earring? Do you need a bookend or do you want, you know, a, a statue in front of your home? Um, just scale it up and hit print. Um, so they'll be taking Christmas orders if you want. <laughs> um, thank you so much for such an engaging conversation and a lot of interactive. Um, and that's the laser scanning is what made the documentation of the theaters possible. Um, thanks to all the students who uh, joined the team. Um, they did everything in just less than two weeks. So. It proves efficiency, also accuracy as well. So I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna take maybe five minutes